this show in gear, motion, on the road. We're emerging into traffic. Welcome to the last session of Poetry in the Park for 2015. I keep forgetting how many years, I think this is the fifth year. This is our ninth week of the summer. This is our big finale with there's Celeste, there's Celeste Snowbird and Candace James in the back, heckling. I'll adjust the mic, hang on. So, a piece of advice in advance, if you come up to the mic tonight, you have to make out with this microphone. Do not stay away from it. You are very close with it. Uh, just want to recognize the city, say thank you very much for having us for yet another summer in the park. And I'd like to recognize too that we're on unceded Coast Salish territory right now. Uh, for our speakers who come out tonight, our poets, please keep in mind there's a playground right behind you, so it's got to be family appropriate. Otherwise, we bring out the tomatoes. <laughs> Since when is love inappropriate, Celeste? Oh. <laughs> If you'd like to be on the open mic and you haven't signed up yet, then please let me know at the break. There'll be a, a short five, ten minute break in between the features and the open mic. Uh, if you're just here to enjoy, then you better enjoy it. <laughs> I'm going to start the show off with a poem of my own tonight. Uh, it's called Here Lies Emmett. Emmett's the name of my great uncle. And tonight we actually went and visited the grave of his mother, Winifred. I think I'd be the first family member to visit that grave in 37 years. And I, if I could have seen her, I would have been the first to see her in about 50 years because she walked out on the family in 1937. And about 20 years later, she tried to come back and they said no. <laughs> so uh, even in death, she tried to elude me, but after about 20 minutes of looking, we found her. There's a reason why they said no. So here comes, here lies Emmett. After her own voice, my great-grandmother Winifred's favorite was her son Desmond's. She performed as Una Mac, but he could be himself with such elocution and some planning. Maureen was good, a few prizes even, but not pretty for a girl. And anyway, Desmond was older, better, would listen to her and strut and swell his voice up there. Even his name was worthy of the bill, unlike five-year-old Bob who refused to be branded as Emmett and hid from her daily in silent terror. Desmond then. It was the 1930s and Hollywood shook stars from the sky. She booked two plane tickets, Vancouver to Los Angeles, and only told her husband Cecil later, offhanded, acting like she hadn't realized it would become a difficulty. He dwelt on how many months of repairing ducks in St. Paul's Hospital had been spent, and she packed two bags, sleeked her fur around her throat. Eleven-year-old Maureen, she commanded, must look after her father, who began to say nothing. Winifred ignored him. Emmett, she announced, could not be trusted. He was a dreadful little thing sometimes, and she knew where naughty boys such as that should go. When the car came, she stuck him in first, disappeared for 20 minutes, returned alone. Cecil watched, wordless. Maureen was long gone, frocked and running. Desmond took his seat beside his mother in the back, lonely and bow-tied, and they left for plain and fame. Two weeks later, unsigned, they returned, reclaiming Bob from the orphanage as they came. 